My 1913 Bradshaw's Handbook to the Chief Cities of the World has brought me to Australia. I will ride some of the longest trains and the world's steepest railway. I'll climb blue mountains and cross red deserts. I'll swim above coral reefs and walk upon golden sands. As I journey across this spectacular continent, I'll discover the gold and silver, coal and wool on which this nation was built. I'll encounter her indigenous people and her national heroes and discover the origins of the millions of immigrants who now call themselves Australians. Australia is vast. Bradshaw says next to the great continents, it is the largest mass of land known. Its greatest length from south to north being 1,971 miles. In 1878, they began to lay tracks here to traverse that daunting distance, but they didn't complete the line until the 21st century. Medieval cathedrals were built faster. I will experience the GAN, one of the world's great railways, and in what the guidebook calls the barren lands and stony deserts, I will encounter the peoples who have inhabited them for 60,000 years. My journey begins on the south coast at Port Augusta where I board the first leg of an ambitious railway to Quorn, before heading to Alice Springs in Australia's Red Centre. I'll continue north to Catherine and its spectacular River Gorge, and finish in Darwin to mark the anniversary of a battle that defined the nation. On my tour, I'll marvel at the power of steam to cross a desert. The day is arid and hot, the terrain is hostile. This is an Australian railway. I'll discover the importance of storytelling for Aboriginal people. It's a way of transferring knowledge to the next generation. So you'd get familiar with how to survive in your environment. It's like a whole map to go right across Australia. And meet the emblem of the nation. Oh, wow. She knows how to do that, doesn't she? She does, yeah. Oh, my. Half the bottle's gone already. <laughs> Port Augusta, says Bradshaws, is a fine natural harbour, the most northerly in South Australia. A transcontinental railway is being constructed by the Commonwealth of Australia to connect it to Darwin on the north coast. It would be nearly a century after my guidebook before it would be completed. Europeans arrived here in 1802 and pioneering farmers established a wool town. Its success led to a rail link through the Flinders Ranges via the Pitchy Ritchie Pass to Quorn in 1879. It was the first stage of the Great Northern Railway, intended to link the port with Darwin on the northern coast of Australia. Morning. Morning. Good day. Jeremy? Oh, good morning, Michael. Welcome to the Commissioner's carriage. Jeremy Brown belongs to the Pitchy Ritchie Preservation Society, which operates the oldest part of the route as a heritage line.
Jeremy, in the early days, what was the impetus to build a railway from Port Augusta to Darwin? In those days, each state of Australia was a separate colony and there was a lot of rivalry. And South Australia was worried Queensland might try and build a railway. So there was a political motivation to, to grab the Northern Territory and make it link firmly to South Australia. There was also a developing agricultural and mining industry. And it, there was a great belief that inland Australia could become a massive breadbasket and a pastoral area. And why does it take more than a century to build? And probably one of the big things was there was a massive depression in Australia in 1891-92. Uh, and the railway really stopped for quite a long time. The line was to take the route carved by one of Australia's most famous explorers, the Scotsman, John McDougall Stewart. His intrepid expeditions between 1858 and 1862 had charted a path across the continent and plotted sources of water along the way. And why was it physically so difficult to build? Just extreme conditions, really. It's very high temperatures, and in between that, flash floods that would wash everything away. Right through the years that the railway operated, it could be closed for a matter of weeks with it following a big storm. That's an extraordinary thought for me, that in what I think of as an entirely arid place, you get these, what, flash floods, do you? You can get very, very heavy rain. And th there's records of more than a metre of water over the railway line on top of the bridge. Now, the other big problem was when you got these flash floods, these giant gum trees would, would get washed down the river and they'd smash the bridge and wash the bridge away. Snaking through the Flinders Ranges and the Pitchy Ritchie Pass, this narrow gauge track formed the first few miles of what has become today's mighty transcontinental route. Railwaymen called it the Afghan Express, or simply the GAN. Hello, John. Hello, Michael. May I go please. aboard? Welcome aboard. Thank you very much mm. indeed. The GAN is one of the world's great railways, but today you ride it in great luxury and comfort. This is where it all began. We pull into Quorn, unimaginably different from Quorndon, the village in Leicestershire in England after which it's named. Just 25 miles from Port Augusta, what was once the railway hub of Australia, and I feel as though I've arrived at the frontier, well, certainly in the outback. I love its architecture, which has been wonderfully untouched and unchanged. The site for the railway town was surveyed in 1878, at a time when transport was by foot or on the backs of animals. Many animals have been successfully acclimatised in Australia, says Bradshaws, such as the camel, alpaca and angora goat. Camels are used as beasts of burden and thrive. 
Yes, indeed, there are now said to be 200,000 feral camels, which is about one for every 100 Australians, which is remarkable for an animal that's not indigenous. So how did they arrive here? Let me uh, have a guess. Ryan. Yeah. I'm Michael. Nice to see you, Michael. Very good to see you. And I see you have some company. Yeah, this is part of the family. Ryan McMillan runs camel tracks in the Flinders Ranges. How did uh, camels arrive in Australia? Well, the first big shipments of camels started coming out in the, the mid-1860s, uh, brought out by Sir Thomas Elder. He was a large uh, landholder in the northern parts of South Australia, which were often getting caught up in droughts. And he saw the, the benefits of using camels, where he was able to bring things off his property, like the bales of wool that were otherwise left stranded there because horse and bullock teams were not able to transport them in the drought times. And this was at a time, of course, when the railroad roads weren't yet connected. Yeah, they were used a lot uh, for carting supplies up for the railway lines, for the, for the building of the line. But even once the railway line went through, it didn't always link up to be one continuous line. The camels were often used to transport the goods from one railhead to the, to the next one. So their heyday was, I suppose, before the period when all the railways were joined up? Yeah, sort of from the, the 1860s up until the, the late 1920s, when you had the invention of motor vehicles, trucks started being brought out into the outback areas and just started putting the camels out of their jobs then. And the old cameliers, they loved their camels and they didn't want to see anything happen to them, so they basically walked them to the edge of the deserts and just let them go then. How do they cope with the flies? I'm not coping too well myself. No, they do pretty well with them. <laughs> yeah, it's one, it's one of the hazards of the outback, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, you get used to them, though. Today, the GAN is one of the world's epic train journeys. It may get its name from the Cameliers, some of whom were Afghans. It covers the 969 miles from Adelaide to Alice Springs in 24 hours. I've arrived in the rust-coloured region called the Red Centre, where white settlers founded the town of Alice Springs in the second half of the 19th century. The population is 25,000. One in five is Aboriginal. I imagine that if you cut out a map of Australia and tried to balance it on a pinhead, you would find that the central point was not very far from Alice Springs. And consequently, today, local people like to boast that no Australian city is much more than two hours' flight away. Indeed, the centrality of this town was its making. Midway on the route pioneered by John McDowell Stewart, Alice Springs was chosen as the hub for a project to connect the isolated continent of Australia with the rest of the world. Hello, Dan. I'm Michael. Nice to meet you, Michael. This is a really historic spot, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is the original town of Alice Springs. This is where it all began back in 1871. These buildings sat at the midpoint of a 2,000-mile overland telegraph line, which spanned the continent from south to north. Dan Fitzgerald can tell me how this tremendous feat of construction transformed Australian life. Dan, this part of Australia used to be very isolated, but it occurs to me that before the arrival of the telegraph, Australia itself was very remote. If you wanted to get a message back to the British motherland, where really most people had friends or family in, in those days in Australia, you'd have to put it on a boat. Um, <laughs> we're talking a, a communication time of three or four months back to England. And, and at that stage, it's all the more frustrating for the British colonists in Australia to know that uh, the British Empire can connect with, with America and with Asia in a matter of hours, and yet it still takes months for them to be able to connect with their friends and family back home in England. 
the British Australian Telegraph Company laid a cable under the sea from Java to Darwin, and the colony of South Australia took charge of erecting a line overland from Adelaide. When a route has been established, how difficult does it prove to be? So it's still still very tough going. I mean, even even once they've charted out the the best possible course, these men are, are felling trees, working with you know two man jigsaws from the, from the backs of uh, horses and camels in some of the harshest terrain and climates in the world. It's uh, it's brutal. Uh, the northern team that uh, went round the the coast by boat. I mean, they had to deal with uh, a, a very severe monsoon period. You know, the poles that they'd sunk were, were washed away. The, the men were, were trapped, isolated. They were uh, suffering from mosquito-borne diseases. In droves, they were coming down with, you know, typhoid, diphtheria, cholera, dysentery. Despite terrible obstacles, the telegraph wire was completed within two years. It was held aloft by 36,000 poles, and the electric signal which spelled out the message was boosted by 11 repeater stations. This was probably one of the great engineering feats of the, the 19th century. They'd gone literally within the space of connecting these two wires from a three or four month communication time with the rest of the British Empire to three to four hours. The Overland Telegraph was the internet of its day. Messages were relayed from this telegraph office until 1932. Uh, hello there, my name's Michael. Pleased to meet you, Michael. Laurie Wallace worked as a telegraphist in the 1940s. I suppose some of this work was private telegrams and some of it would have been official business, would it? Yes, you were handling about 60 telegrams per hour. Did people have clever ways of abbreviating in order to keep down their words? The telegraphists of yesteryear used acronyms because that speeded up his sending of the messages. Mm -hmm. For congratulations, we would use CNGTNS. Mm -hmm. And for that, TT, just two signals. <coughs> Instead of <coughs> Morse is music. It's music to the ears. <laughs> You're laughing. You can laugh in Morse. You were laughing heartily. Yes. And th if you were at the distant end and told me a funny joke, yes. and uh, you laughed like, uh, and I thought it was hum very humorous, I would laugh like this. <coughs> but if it was not very humorous, and I thought, oh, that's pretty corny, I would laugh like this. <coughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you very much. A hundred years ago, the British, in common with other peoples, were instinctively racist and that is amply reflected in my Bradshaw's guide. The Aboriginal inhabitants of Australia are low in the scale of humanity, and the women are inferior to the men. That outlook today shocks us. For much of the 20th century, it underpinned the official policy of governments in Australia. I've arranged to meet Dr. Pat Miller, who's an Arundel woman. Pat, tell me a little, if you would, about the Arundel people and their way of life. The Arundel people have had uh, a very strong association with this country for some 40, 50, 60,000 years. You know, we foraged off the land, we drank the waters in the soak, and we hunted for game and an animals for food and survival. When the first white men came to this part of Central Australia, it was the Arunda people that uh, showed them the water, showed them the trails. They were always very welcoming, and today is no different. Tell me about your grandparents, if you would. Who were they? Uh, my grandmother was an Arunda woman from country here, and my grandfather was a Scotsman from the Shetland Islands. What happened to your grandfather's children? 
when they were four or five and the police officer and the welfare officer went to where they were living and demanded that they take the children in and put them into an institution. That institution was known as the bungalow. It was where part Aboriginal children, taken from their families, would spend their childhoods under the guardianship of the state protector. The children were put into the institution purely because they were of mixed race, is that yes, right? Yes, yes. What was the institution's attitude to their ethnic origin and their culture? Well, the attitude was to assimilate, get the Aboriginality right out of them. Even I witnessed, when I first started school, children getting caned for speaking language in the schoolyard. What sort of conditions were there in the institution? Well, you know, Dad used to tell us that uh, uh, there was never ever enough food. Uh, in the middle of cold winter nights, they all slept on one mattress and, and got warm by holding onto each other. And they had one old army blanket to cover them. You know, if, if the people didn't like the way they looked at you or, or they didn't hurry up when they were called, they got caned. They, they were dealt with really harshly and quite cruel. Mm. Did he have any connection with his parents while he was in the bungalow? Not while he was in the bungalow, but he always knew that they were around because they'd often go to the fence line and, and call out of the night time in language and let them know that they're not far away. What has been the impact on, on you and your, and your peoples of these lost generations of children? We've had people who've been removed and found their way back. Um, We've never ever questioned. We've just uh, wrapped our arms around them and welcomed them back in the family. But do the people feel wounded by these experiences of oh. the lost generation? Certainly, certainly. Uh, that pain for some never ever heals. For a modern day traveller like me, the millennia old culture of the Aboriginal peoples holds great fascination. Hello, Rayleigh. Hello, Michael. How are you? It's great to see you. Great to see you in the centre as well. Raylene Brown is an expert on indigenous bush tucker. Wow. What is that you have there? Roasted wattle, which I've just put near the, near the hot coals on the fire. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier for grinding. So this is a very traditional indigenous way of preparing food. It is. Now have a go at that. Yeah, just put a little bit in there. It's a real art to do this. It'd take a long time to get enough to make a seed cake. <laughs> but it's releasing a lovely scent as I go. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, nutty um, kind of scent it has. What are these other things that you have here? So here we have, and we have a bush tomato. So these were our vitamin tablets of the desert. But they're very suitable for making chutneys and things, but we just eat them like this off the bush. Yeah, like it, it, it tastes quite like chutney just as it is. Yeah. Mm. That's nice. And what we have here is a little bush banana. <laughs> Somebody went along and saw one hanging there and saw the indigenous people eating it. And they said, oh, that looks like a green banana. So that's what, what it got called. And you can eat the flowers of this little fruit as well. Uh, and you were brought up to understand all this? Yes, I was. As a young child, um, we had a very nomadic family. We lived off country for, for many, many years, eating what we could get our hands on. And um, I'm so glad that I had that time to learn and to get a respect and to look back at my ancestors and how they survived. I wonder how these ancestral traditions have been preserved. A dreaming story is how people would have shared knowledge about country and plants. And you started learning these dreaming stories as a very young child. Mm. So you'd be, you'd be observing your parents um, when they were gathering foods or going to a site. Um, and that story would be repeated over and over again as you grew up. It's a way of transferring knowledge to the next generation. So you'd get familiar with how to survive in your environment. And if you look at things from above, it's like a, 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 a whole map of stories and dreamtime stories that go right across Australia. Mm -hmm. 
As darkness falls, I'm invited to join Raylene and her friends around a campfire. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Hello. You, Hello. Oh, you might need this for the flies. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now, that is a brilliant invention. <laughs> I've needed that all day. <laughs> is this where you might tell dreamtime stories? Yeah, it's about sharing and, and it's also about connecting with each other. Was there any way that the stories were recorded? Everything in, in our culture had a song, like every tree, every animal, our dreamtime stories and history stories all have a song about it. And that's how our people were able to maintain these records about the environment around us. Because, because songs were, were memorable. Yep. Mm. People didn't have to write things down, but these songs were brought to life through ceremony, art, drawings in the sand and storytelling. Uh, um, what's that painting over there? Well, this painting here is one of my paintings. And so these are women and the smaller ones are the children. So it's like you're looking down on the scene and the ladies are teaching the children where to dig for the honey ants and, um, and then gathering them all together and then they eat them. It's like a little sweet treat. Yeah. You've done that yourself? Yeah. They're good? Yeah. And how long has this sort of painting existed? In 1971 was the start of the Western Desert art movement. And it was started by a white school teacher who was watching some Aboriginal men telling stories on the ground. He thought, well, how can we record this? So he gave boards and paint to his school students. And then the men wanted to try as well. So it's almost, it's almost like a written language now in itself. It is, yes. Yeah. yeah. How far has Australia got, do you think, in moving towards being a generally multi-ethnic place? We are a multicultural country, but there's a lot more um, acceptance to be had yet, I think. Yeah, it's about acknowledging the first people that were here because they were here so long yeah. before, before anyone else came. And yeah. so they have an intimate knowledge of the land, but there wasn't that sense of we own the land. No. They belong to the mm. land. It's a huge cultural difference, isn't it, between um, white people believing in ownership and um, indigenous yeah. people not believing yeah. in ownership. Completely. Well, you've told some wonderful stories by the glow of the fire, and I found it literally enlightening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for being a good listener. I'm making an early start to experience a moment that must be special for any visitor to Australia. Of kangaroos, says Bradshaws, the giant kangaroo is the largest standing at six feet high, while there are over a score of species besides wallaby, tree kangaroo, rat kangaroo, etc. In truth, the relationship between kangaroos and Australians, whom they vastly outnumber, has had its ups and downs. But today there is no doubt that this creature is the undisputed icon of this great country. Roger, hello. How are you going? I'm Michael. G'day, Michael. And this is Joey, I imagine. Yeah, this is little Max. Hey, little Max. Little Max. But he is a Joey, is that right? He is a Joey, yep. Yeah. He's, uh, unfortunately, he's orphaned. Mum was a roadkill. Ah. And I'm now his new mum. Is it all right to um, to touch Joey, is that? Oh, no, you can take him. Yeah. Max? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, Max. Oh. Oh. Well, he seems very accustomed to human beings. Yeah, he is. Uh, as long as you hold a baby kangaroo in a pillowcase like this, uh -huh. it sort of imitates mum's pouch. Oh, gives I see. Them the security like mum's pouch. Right. Oh, Max. Chris Barnes, also known as Brolga, set up his kangaroo sanctuary in Alice Springs in 2005. 
The 188-acre site is currently home to around 50 kangaroos, whose mothers have been killed in road accidents. How do you communicate with the ones that are further afield, then? Well, before I go out in the bush, I always call to them, but it's sort of quite loud, so it echoes. Right. So it's like... And that just lets them know that we're on our way out. Let me see whether I can give that one a go. That's not bad, mate. Certainly paralyzed the kangaroos. <laughs> So I suppose kangaroos and Australians have had a somewhat complicated history. English came to Australia and set up farming, and kangaroos have found our farms to be a, a great place to reside, lots of water and, and crops. And uh, so that's, of course, become competition with the farmer. So They've been regarded as pests then. It uh, hasn't been a good relationship. And yet today we think of the kangaroo as absolutely the symbol of the country, don't we? It is. The kangaroo is a part of who we are. There's nothing more Australian than the kangaroo. Why is it that you sometimes see kangaroos portrayed with boxing gloves? Kangaroos, when they fight, they're boxers. You know, it's toe-to-toe, -to -toe, like guys in the boxing ring. Right. So kangaroos have really become renowned for not backing down in a fight. Right. In the early 1900s, uh, I mean, just before World War I, around that time, uh, for entertainment, some circuses, theatres, uh, fairs, things like that, they used to put a pair of boxing gloves on a big male kangaroo and, and have people go in and box him. And Good Lord. That's why in war, the boxing kangaroo, kangaroo with boxing gloves being painted on our aircraft and our warships, it's a sign of we don't back down in a fight. We'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with you and, and take you on. See, at, at this age, a kangaroo like Tilly still like a bottle of milk. She's picked you out, mate. Would you yeah. like to give her this? She has picked me out, hasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here that. we are then. Yeah, yeah, there you oh. go. Oh, wow. She knows how to do that, doesn't she? She does, yeah. Oh, my God. Half the bottle's gone already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't waste any time. It's all gone. I'm catching a ride to Bond Springs to find out how settlers tamed the outback. Bradshaws tells me that Central Australia is in parts suitable for agriculture and fit for grazing purposes. Unlike the koala, the crocodile and the kangaroo, the cow is not indigenous to Australia. And yet by the time of my Bradshaws guidebook, there were about seven million here. So there must be a story there, as I hope to discover at this cattle station. This is home to the Heaslip family, who took over the station in the 1960s. The place is managed by husband and wife, Ben and Laura. Hi, Laura. Hello, Michael. Ben. G'day, Michael. It's so good of you to have me here. Laura, I feel like I'm amongst Australian cattle history here. How far back does this station go? Uh, Bond Springs um, was first settled, Michael, in the early 1870s by um, two men, Mr Yule and Mr Willoughby, that um, originally immigrated out from England. They were in South Australia to begin with, so they walked from South Australia up to the Northern Territory. It took them about a year to get here. That is amazing. Cattle pioneers faced great hardships, but serious fortunes could be made 
and none was more famous than that of the early 20th century cattle king, Sidney Kidman. In 1910, he bought the lease. He had about um, 83,000 square miles of land. We're talking about cattle stations here, which are the size of European countries. Yes, that's correct. He started off when at the age of 13, and he left home on a one-eyed horse with five <laughs> shillings to his name. It's a real rags to riches story. Uh, do you think it was all done by fair means? Well, you'd like to believe so. Cattle thieving used to go on in those early days. If you came across what we call clean skin cattle, which is an unbranded beast, he would put his brand on it and claim it as his own. <laughs> yeah, the wild centre was kind of like the Wild West. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Today, there are some 47,000 cattle producers in Australia, and beef production extends over nearly half the continent. Ben Heaslip looks after up to 5,000 cattle at this 900 square mile station. I would like to separate a few of these cattle. Would you be able to give me a hand, please? I would. This is a drafting platform. We can sort them out right here. OK. Very handsome cattle. I'll run them through. Mm -hmm. And can you please... Um, Operate the gate. Yep, open the lever. Yep. Thank you. Walk in, little mate. Now we'll close this one and... I'm ready to let them through. In you go. Job done. Thank you very much, Michael. Great job done. I think I've earned a tea break. Thank you very much. Who plays? I play a bit of guitar. I started playing around the campfire in the stock camps. Really? Um, Can we hear one of yours? This is a uh, Born Down Under. Born Down Under, very appropriate. Born Down Under, a red hot land. Mm, yeah, yeah. We're born down under, the blue sky. I love the ocean, I love the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're born down under. Yeah, yeah. We're born down under, hey, hey, hey. The, the red heart land. Oh, the red heart land. We're born down under. The blue sky. The blue sky, I the love the people. people. <laughs> the red heart land, they're <laughs> born down under. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now for a big moment in any train lover's life, a journey of more than 1,400 kilometres on the GAN, across some of the most forbidding terrain in the world, Australia's Northern Territory. The train itself is nearly a kilometre long, 38 carriages, and the best thing of all, in outrageous luxury. The train is hauled by two locomotives and three power vans. It contains four kitchens, five restaurants, five bars, four carriages of staff accommodation, and 19 of passenger bedrooms. Very nice. Own bathroom, including shower. I think this will convert into two bunks, even though I'm on my own. And plenty of room to hang my hat. 
My journey north from Alice Springs continues through the night and arrives at Catherine in the morning. I'll then complete the route of the GAN, finishing in the coastal city of Darwin. I think when you're on a luxury train with fine dining, you really have to dress the part. It's all a matter of maintaining standards. Rumour has it there's a group of imposters on board, so I'm heading to the bar to investigate. What a magnificent sight you are, gentlemen. Oh, I'm Michael. Oh, my goodness. We needed a theme for our trip. We were reconnected. So, you know, obviously a fan of yours. We thought, we do like my your gear, so we thought, why don't we try and match it? So we've gone to enormous trouble, can I tell you. We've been researching for days. So we're all good mates and wives, aren't yeah, yeah. Hello, ladies. This is the Nicolettes. Had word got out that I was on the train? No, we haven't. No, no, no. It was absolutely random. Yeah, it's been in the planning for what, six, six or eight months. And this just happened to be the time slot that it suited everybody to be able to come along. Well, well, yeah, well, you've well. made it. It's, it's an opportunity of a lifetime to meet us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Gaan edition. Yeah. Well, I didn't know there was a Gaan well, edition. There is now. There is now. There is now. There is now yeah. But excuse me, sir. <laughs> this this Gaan edition does not look in its contents as though it is a Gaan edition. <laughs> <laughs> What is this? This is some cheap fiction, is that right? <laughs> you'd have, to ask, you'd have to ask the author here. It's in the Mark, making. Mark, it's, <laughs> I've just started with the cover. <laughs> How very smart. Uh, Michael, we'd love you to um, help us tonight judge the winner. Yes. Now, what's the competition about? Is it the best dress or the most Michael Portillo most Michael. life? Most got to, Michael it's Portillo. definitely got to be the most Michael yeah. Portillo. All right, gentlemen, stand up, please. OK. Oh, yes. Let's have a look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. I've decided that the one who is the most Michael Portillo like is you, sir, clutching my brother. <laughs> oh, no. Bravo. Morning. Good morning, Michael. How are you this morning? Good to see you. Good morning. Slept well, thank you. Overnight, the GAN has propelled us nearly 700 miles north. Oh, thank you. Despite having travelled such an enormous distance, we are still in Australia's Northern Territory and now approaching the town of Catherine. Bradshaw says it would appear that Aboriginal numbers were never large and that the life led by them was, in many parts of the country, a precarious one. I rather doubt whether a century ago, Indigenous history had been deeply studied by white scholars and I shall be interested to know whether that contention holds good today. Goodbye, Kaylee. See you, Michael. Have a great day in Catherine. Thank you. 
I've alighted close to the Catherine River, which runs through the traditional lands of a number of Aboriginal groups. Jamie, hi. Michael, how are you, bud? Good to see you. Welcome aboard. This is your boat right here. What a beautiful spot. Absolutely exquisite beauty. This is such a special place. And I imagine for as long as human beings have known it, it must have been regarded that way through thousands of years of history. Jamie Brooks is a guide to the Catherine Gorge, which forms part of a national park. I use a guidebook which is more than 100 years old. Huh. And forgive me for saying this, the guidebook says that the Aboriginal existence was precarious. Would that be true? Uh, no, uh, it definitely wasn't because, uh, you know, obviously people have lived here for thousands and thousands of years, otherwise they, the Aboriginal nation wouldn't have lasted, you know, a hundred years. Everything you see around us had a use of some sort to the people, not only in the past, but even to this day. It's not only a permanent water uh, source. We've got 45 species of fish in here, uh, crocodile, turtle, and also, being the only water attracts all the animals that live up the top, like your kangaroo, wallaby, down into the gorge. So very important for uh, creating a source of food. Since my guidebook was written, scientists have dated Aboriginal life in this area back many thousands of years, using evidence discovered in the gorge. So, Jamie, this is, uh, this is what we've come to see. Uh, very magnificent. H how long ago might these have been painted? Well, these paintings that we're looking at up on the wall here are actually around eight to 10,000 years old. Uh -huh. uh, do we have any idea why the people painted them? Was it for the joy of art or were they trying to communicate something? Um, this area used to be a very popular camping ground, so we've got paintings done by women, children, men. And what it is is a record uh, to passing families through the area of what foods are here. Ah, OK. Yes. Well, uh, kangaroos by the look of it, is that right? Yep, so up in the high set we've got uh, kangaroos. We also have a lot of extinct animals really? painted throughout the gorge. Mm. Which ones? Um, so you might be able to notice uh, right down the bottom in the, the high set there's like a large sort of a turtle shape. That's an animal which we don't know what it is. As you look at these paintings, and what, do, what do they make you feel? It's, it's quite amazing to be able to look at something so clear and so old. Like, we're looking at something that was... Some of these paintings were done before the pyramids were made. Yes. And it gives you goosebumps sometimes. Yes. Magnificent. Thank you for bringing me. Not a problem. I'm glad you came. I am too. I am too. I'm rejoining the GAN for the final leg of this journey. The route from Adelaide to Darwin was completed only in 2004, at long last achieving the 19th century ambition to join Australia from south coast to north and creating one of the longest south to north passenger rail journeys in the world. Having crossed the Elizabeth Bridge, we know that our destination is at hand. The Gan has crossed the continent to arrive at Australia's only tropical capital, Darwin. Really enjoyed it, thanks. Very well. Bye. Darwin looks out across the Timor Sea towards Asia. It's the most sparsely populated capital city in Australia. 
and is named after Charles Darwin, elaborator of the theory of evolution. It boasts the oldest colonial era building in the Northern Territory. Your Honour. What... Welcome to Government House, Michael. What a pleasure to be here. The administrator of the territory, her honour, the Honourable Vicky O'Halloran, represents Australia's head of state, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. What a house. I mean, with this veranda wrapping around and the um, ceiling fans here, it has a very colonial feel. How old is it? Uh, this house was uh, built between 1870 and 1871. The great thing is that this house, it hasn't changed a, a great deal for decades. People of Darwin have a reputation for being resilient. And in this humidity and heat, I begin to understand this. But is yes. there more to it? People of the whole of the Northern Territory have the reputation of resilience because it goes hand in hand. We have a diverse community, and that brings a, a sense of resilience. That it's uh, holding your own onto your own culture and um, having the stamina to do that and share it uh, brings that certain depth, I think, of courage and tenacity. There we are, Michael, our beautiful Darwin Harbour. Spectacular. And they tell me it's bigger than Sydney's. It is bigger than Sydney's. It's a tropical view, so you can't capture that anywhere else in, in Australia. You are set apart. I've arrived in Darwin on the eve of Anzac Day, this nation's most important act of remembrance. On the centenary, of the end of the First World War. Darwin was also heavily bombed during the Second World War. Military historian Norm Cramp can tell me what these events meant for this city and for the whole of Australia. Norm, Anzac Day is marked on the 25th of April, which in 1915 was the day of the commencement of the Gallipoli campaign. What role does Gallipoli play in the Australian psyche? It was our baptism of fire it was the first time that the Australians had fought as, a, uh, as one unit. Prior to that, we'd fought at the Boer War, but as colonial units. So Gallipoli was, um, was our first uh, event where we actually fought as Australian forces. The British Empire sent thousands of Australian and New Zealand volunteers, known as Anzacs, to Gallipoli to capture the Dardanelles from Turkey. After eight months of stalemate and heavy losses, the battle ended with the evacuation of Allied troops. What came out of Gallipoli and out of the First World War was that Australia developed its own identity. And, and I think that's really important to Australians and um, that remains uh, across the Australian community today. Here we are facing Asia, I believe. Does that make Darwin a very special place in terms of the defence of the homeland? Yeah, absolutely. And as um, history has proven, you know, in 1942, when the Japanese raided, it was Darwin that they attacked because they realised the strategic importance of Darwin. Our military history here, I would say, is, is more uh, important uh, than anywhere else um, in Australia. long before dawn on the 25th of April and a huge crowd has already gathered in Darwin because this is Anzac Day. Some veterans are here displaying their medals, but amongst the crowd there are many people in shorts and t-shirts. This is an extraordinary display of public commitment to commemoration of the day back in 1915 and the hour when Australian and New Zealand forces stormed Gallipoli.
100 years ago, the First World War ended. It was a war that took an enormous toll on our young country. More than 400,000 men enlisted. 60,000 lost their lives. On this day and throughout this year, we remember their sacrifice. I offer this nation's heartfelt gratitude. Across the lives of many courageous Australians to pioneer the routes of the telegraph and the railway across the continent along the course that I have travelled. When the Anzacs set out to defend their country and the British Empire, some chose the combative boxing kangaroo as their emblem. We must never forget them. But thousands of years before that empire, Australia was already populated. And nowadays, those indigenous people are being remembered too. Next time, our ride on the world's steepest railway. It looks more like a roller coaster than a train. Get stuck in with the life saving patrol on Bondi Beach. Heave! Ah. And travel in style on the transcontinental Indian Pacific Railway. This is uh, all part of my fantasy of living in another age. And that's here next Saturday at 8. Next tonight, an intimate and revealing portrait of one of Britain's greatest designers, Westwood, punk, icon, activist. Then step back into the realm of eleganza extravaganza. The new series of Paws struts in with a double bill from 1020.